Hello, everyone, and welcome to this exciting new gen webinar entitled Hacking the Immune Response, Novel Vaccine Designed to Combat Pandemic Diseases. This webinar was made possible through sponsorship from Sinobiological. I'm Jeff Bogaliskis, the technical editor for Gen, and I'll be your host today for the webinar. I'm going to dispense with my normal openings and jump right into introducing our two speakers because we have two great presentations that we'd like to get to right away. First up, Dr. Jacob Glanville is the president, CEO, and founder of Cenovax, which is looking to develop broad spectrum therapeutics for a variety of pathogens such as COVID-19 and influenza, as well as anti-wound and anti-venom medicines. Dr. Glanville has developed multiple seminal methods in the fields of high throughput antibody repertoire sequencing, repertoire decoding algorithms, single cell TCR receptor and phenotype sequencing, deconstructing genetic variation in the adaptive immune response, and computationally guided antibody library engineering. Today, Jake is gonna tell us more about his work with computational immunology, interrogation of the adaptive immune response to better understand why immune responses rarely target conserved epitopes. Should be very exciting. Following Jake's presentation, we're gonna hear from Dr. Yuning Chen, who is an R&D manager at Sinobiological, where he's responsible for strategic design of recombinant protein products, development and custom project oversight. Yuning is gonna provide some scientific insight toward the product offerings at Sino Biological for infectious disease research. But before we begin, as always, I wanna remind everyone to send in their questions for Jacob and Yuning for the Q&A session that is gonna occur right after their presentations. All you need to do is click the ask a question tab on the right hand side of your screen, type in your question and hit submit. You can send them in at any time during the presentations. All right, with that said, let's get to our presentations. Jake, I'm gonna turn the mic and the audience over to you. Greetings, my name is Jacob Glanville. I am the founder and CEO of Centivax. Today, I'll be talking to you about our vaccine programs. First, a little background on Centivax. Back in 2012, I co-founded a company called Distributed Bio. We grew Distributed Bio by performing antibody discovery and optimization services on 78 different programs for 60, group, 60 different organizations. I split up the company last year, sold the services business to Charles River Laboratories for $104 million and spun out our therapeutics portfolio business as well as our vaccine programs. Cinevax now represents that effort. We have a powerful senior leadership team that with tremendous amount of expertise in driving molecules to clinic and being able to develop medicines that matter. We have a tremendous amount of non-dilutive and strategically aligned support from organizations, including the Armed Forces, the Gates Foundation, the National Institute of Health, and many others. These groups work with us because we focus on infectious disease and other areas of unmet medical need that are particularly important to both the military populations at large and indeed the world. This is our entire portfolio. You may know us best for our SARS-CoV-2 injectable, which is about to go clinical. Today, what I'll be largely talking about is our influenza program. This is a broad spectrum vaccine to treat both seasonal as well as pandemic influenza. As I mentioned, we are about to go clinical. And for that program, we've also worked with Sinobiological in particular to use their large panel of RBD mutants to help us characterize our broadly neutralizing antibody and its ability to neutralize many of the new variants, including the South African strain, the Brazilian strain, the UK strain, the Japanese strain, the Californian strain, and so forth. It's a lot of work to go clinical. We're excited to become a clinical stage company in six months since founding, uh, approximately June 1st. But that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is our broad spectrum vaccine program. We work with many different organizations uh, as a small company to be able to enable us to move from initial discovery all the way into clinical. And Sinobiological, our partner in these presentations today, is a big part of that because, as you'll see, it enabled us in the unique way that we used our technology to begin testing and optimizing a broad spectrum vaccine technology over the last five years. So uh, if you've heard of us at all, 
in the vaccine space, you may have seen a Netflix documentary series called Pandemic, How to Prevent an Outbreak. Shown there on the bottom is uh, Sarah Ives and I at our research facility that I built down in Guatemala. Hundred years ago, a deadly influenza virus infected hundreds of millions of people, somewhere in the order of 50 to 100 million deaths. When we talk about another flu pandemic happening, it's not a matter of if, but when. A new strain of bird flu. This is definitely one of the most lethal influenza viruses that we have seen so far. It just takes one person to start an outbreak. It will leave its mark. The result would be hundreds of millions of people that would likely die. That's why I do what I do. We're making a vaccine that could treat all future versions of flu. This vaccine could eradicate influenza as we know it. We are in charge of our children. The problem so widespread, the World Health Organization is calling the refusal to vaccinate one of the biggest threats of 2019. A healthy child has the ability to build up immunity naturally. I know that what I do is important to my patients, but what am I doing to myself and my family? Within one month, the virus can spread throughout the country. A month after that, widespread throughout the world. The next pandemic is going to start. We just don't know where or how, but we know it will. That poses an existential threat to us as a species. Yeah, so that came out um, January 25th. That was within one day of China quarantining 57 million people. And that was in 2020. So spooky timing, but really not that much because there's always a pandemic happening. Uh, this one's a particularly bad one that we're in right now, but we've had HIV, we've had Ebola multiple times, we've had SARS, we've had five influenza pandemics, we've had the plagues, and indeed since the beginning of time we have fought large outbreaks of infectious disease, and that's why we do what we do to try to make medicines to treat them. So well, let me start by saying that vaccines work. Vaccines have remarkably changed modern human health by being able to uniquely to eradicate or diminish close to eradication the diseases that they treat. And that, that's fundamentally different than uh, antibiotics and other anti-infectives that could treat someone who is sick, but maybe not protect a population from the exposure to the pathogen in the first place. That's exciting. The problem is that vaccines don't work particularly well against rapidly mutating viruses. Um, we obviously know this right now because of the current pandemic. Um, this is an illustration of influenza. So the seasonal influenza vaccine shown in red, that's how well it's performed over a series of years going back to 2005, 2006 flu season. You can see first off, it's not very effective. You're talking about down to 10% up to maybe 50, luckily, and not even 60% efficacy. Uh, and, and it varies quite a bit from year to year. And that's a function of how well People can predict what the virus is going to be like eight months in advance, 12 months in advance, when they have to start making plans to make that batch of flu. They're making a guess on the kind of virus that it's going to be in the future, just like you watch people do with the coronavirus. You have to estimate and build towards the virus as it is now, and then you go into a big manufacturing process. By the time you're done, the virus could have changed. And so sometimes it doesn't have a good fit to the season. What we are intending to do is that dotted blue line. It's something that is first off, much more efficacious, that higher percentage closer to what you're seeing with the good uh, coronavirus vaccines. Uh, and second, it's more even. It has a broad spectrum or universal vaccine characteristic, so it just works the same every year. Uh, that's, that's the objective that we're working towards. Why do we think we can accomplish this? So um, about 20 years ago, uh, a number of groups began researching influenza and identifying a set of these broadly neutralizing antibodies that uh, they hit these conserved sites that are shown in red on the circulating, the circling hemagglutinin on the left. And if you're lucky enough to hit those conserved sites with an antibody, then you can neutralize many different versions of influenza because they're not, uh, across all of them, able to mutate that site easily. That means that if you can get a vaccine to elicit such antibodies from a person, you would enjoy broad immunity against many different influenzas. And so thus began the hunt for a universal influenza vaccine. Many different technologies have been attempted uh, and they have all so far proven unsuccessful. There was a, on the top left, a COBRA based approach, which is a consensus method. And it really just resulted in antibodies against the consensus that didn't bind to any of the strain variants and wasn't very predictive of the future, unfortunately. There were multiple, uh, slightly more successful methods um, shown on the bottom left 
where the attempt was to try to engineer a stabilized version of just the stem of hemagglutinin or to otherwise decorate or obfuscate the non-interesting epitopes with the argument being that the stem was more conserved. And that's helped, but it hasn't actually helped enough to be able to uh, solve the entire problem. So then there have been methods up on the top right, which is a cross boost exchange where there you, you immunize first 1990, then 2000, then 2010 and so forth. Uh, and that, that turns out not to be that successful either. And indeed, if that was successful, then we would all be protected because that's what the virus does to us. It seasonally modifies um, it seasonally modifies uh, the, the, vi the virus uh, and then we're re-exposed to it year after year. And yet none of us establish, or the majority of us do not establish broad immunity. Uh, I remember Mark Davis once said, you, you don't always get what you want, but you always get your, what you select for. And the problem is that these things are all not quite selecting for the breadth that we want. So our approach here was to try to really, we spent the last 10 years using computational immunology and digging into why is it that these conserved sites exist and yet we miss them year after year. Every time you get a vaccine, that conserved site was present, but your immune system prefers to bind elsewhere. So on the left, I broke down the conservation distribution of the amount of diversity in a human body, about 100 million unique B cell receptors. The amount that were elicited after vaccination, which is about a thousand uh, after immunization with the vaccine, and we determined that from deep sequencing, us and others. And then finally, the number of unique responding antibodies that uh, emerge uh, from the elicited B cells to produce sufficient plasma to uh, create protection. And that's about a hundred. So you get a vaccine and you get about a hundred antibodies in response. So of course, the second question is, okay, I get a hundred antibodies. How many unique epitopes are there on the surface of hemagglutinin um, that could be bound? And it turns out it's a lot more than 100. We identify hundreds of thousands of unique binding epitopes. This is using in silico cloud-based protein-protein docking experiments of all known human antibodies um, docked all over the surface of hemagglutinin. Not to find the correct answer, but just to ask how many unique uh, orientations and ways could an antibody bind the surface of hemagglutinin. And in fact, if you consider that an antibody doesn't need to, to bind with all residues on the, the CDRs mattering for contact or all CDR or all positions in the contact interface mattering for binding, as we know to be the case with uh, epitope mutagenesis studies, then the problem is dramatically more diverse, that there are billions of potential contact epitopes on the surface of hemagglutinin. And the reason I did all this is that once you have that big database, you can then ask the question, what proportion of uh, the components in that database are universally conserved or partially conserved or seasonal strain specific? And the distribution is such that uh, it turns out that universal epitopes are extremely rare. Uh, they represent uh, basically a one in a million event, whereas the vast majority of the immune response is relatively general. And so that's essentially the, the challenge and therefore the engineering solution. Non-conserved epitopes vastly outconserve broadly neutralizing epitopes. That's why we miss. That's why you get a vaccine. You don't seem to hit those conserved epitopes is they're, they're hidden in an ocean of non-conserved epitopes. The vast majority of your antibodies will hit sites that bind to one to three strains and then go away. That's how the virus escapes you. And therefore, even if you get one relatively conserved epitope, if you have 100 antibodies, that only represents 1% of your immune response. Your title will go down 99 fold on seasonal change. That also provides, therefore, the engineering objective, which is a broad spectrum vaccine must shift the distribution by eliminating strain specific activation from overwhelming the vaccine response. We should be able to, uh, by, by eliminating the strain specific epitopes, we can then shift the distribution towards not just having one, but having the entire B-cell response after a vaccine recognizing broad epitopes. And that is the only reliable mechanism by which we can create a broad spectrum vaccine uh, that's mediated by antibodies. So here's how we do that. And this gets us back to Sinobiological. Our technology is that we identify a diverse pool of variants from 1918 to 2008. We chose 30. Uh, we dilute them such that each one is too low of a concentration to elicit an effective immune response. And then we combine them and we co-administer them at the same time to the subject, in this case, a, a pig. Uh, in order to be able to do this, back when we, I was first testing this method, I needed a way to be able to have 30 different hemagglutinin variants very quickly. And uh, it would have been a major problem if I had to go express and characterize all of those 
in-house. Fortunately, Sinobiological had a large and growing library of hemagglutinins that we could work off of. Uh, so we were able to work with their library, internalize them. They have expertise in expressing these proteins. And so we were able to validate that they expressed well. And I was able to run the initial set of animal studies quite quickly. Um, the power of this technology, as you can see here, is that if you co-administer a pool where each hemagglutinin is a sub-efficacious sub dose, a sub-immunogenic um, dose, then B cells that recognize a single strain don't get enough antigen to activate, whereas B cells that recognize a shared epitope essentially get a, relation, a concentration conservation relationship that we're coupling those two so that their concentration of antigen that they're able to perceive is linearly correlated to the conservation of the epitope they're able to bind to. So if they hit all 30 components, they get 30 fold the dose. And in that way, we preferentially dose BNABs and we produce a broad spectrum response in the organs. This is our first example of setting up. You can see there the sinobiological uh, tubes. And these were our first studies. So we did three rapid iterations of studies at our research facility in Guatemala and then our laboratory in the United States. In study one, we were trying to establish the concept and the basic uh, mechanism of action that we were eliciting a broader response in the animals compared to controls. In study two, we were aiming to establish that not only do you get binding, but you achieve broad neutralization and again, against future viruses. This is an area where the other technologies really had struggled that they, sometimes they would get some breadth, but the antibodies would be too weak to enable neutralization. And then study three was an optimization study to give less shots, um, to give a higher, tighter and longer protection. And that's really a, the practicality of not wanting to have to boost an animal multiple times or a human, you want to have it as convenient as possible. Um, so these are our piggies. This was the laboratory facility developed in Guatemala. Um, I'm holding a piggy named Squionce. And you can see over on the right, that's Sarah Ives, who was my lead researcher on this project. Um, so the result of the first studies were, were quite remarkable. We identified first off that there was this threshold dose below which you don't get any immune response. You can inject 50 nanograms of a hemagglutinin into a pig and they, they don't respond to it. Whereas if you do that with 30 components, each at 50 nanograms, then not only do they respond to each component, but also they respond to other heterologous viruses not included in the mixture. And that's, that's shown on in section A. Sections B, C, and D further explore that concept and give us some guidance into dosing considerations and the number of components we'd like to add. And section E is really stunningly showing the effect of us combining a mixture of those hemagglutinins in the C3 component, that's concentration conservation coupling, C3, versus the bivalent and a vehicle control. So blue is stronger reactivity. You've got a bunch of pigs shown in each group down on the x-axis. And then there's a century, century of hemagglutinin shown on the y-axis. And what you can see is as we lowered the dose of our method, of our technology, the C3 method, um, we get a more and more broad and powerful response against almost everything that we tested against. Uh, this was the moment that we first got the first round of data back. It was a, <laughs> a Friday evening in the laboratory and it was pretty exciting because up until then we'd worked for months without knowing whether the method was, was successful. And, and in general, there's many ways that science can fail and few ways that it can succeed. And this was our first proof positive and it was a good day. So of course, binding is not enough. We wanted to establish neutralization. So you can see here, this is the effort uh, led by Sarah to go build out a large panel of neutralizing virus in our laboratory. Um, and then you can see there, uh, Christina Pettis um, providing some of the results of the characterization of, of the virus from allantoic fluid. And the consequence of those studies were pretty remarkable. It showed that uh, compared to a bivalent from 2007 that neutralized that year quite well, but if you look to future viruses, there was marginal neutralization of NH3N2, uh, and there are um, not really anything from uh, anything beyond 2011, and certainly not the H1N1s. Um, our method, where we made a mixture of hemagglutinins from before 2008, neutralized back to 1934 and all the way out to 2015, so including the pandemic influenza strain. So we were able to neutralize uh, future viruses. Uh, in, in, in a neutralization assay and quite potently so in, in pigs. And that's kind of, a, that's a breakthrough. That's something that's pretty exciting. So uh, we've moved forward with those studies now supported by the Gates Foundation. Uh, we're working with the University of Georgia and Auburn University 
looking at both ferrets and at pigs. We're attempting multiple different uh, adjuvants and delivery agents to try to minimize the number of doses and maximize that immune response. So those studies are ongoing now. And then uh, moving into live challenge studies. Next steps would be uh, manufacturing and clinical development in humans. And then we're also looking into a veterinary market with the USDA for, for pigs. There are manufacturing unique challenges for a 30 component vaccine, but it really is only a matter of degree. There already are 23 valent vaccines that exist. So this is just a little bit larger. We can either bite the bullet and pay that big expensive cost. We only have to pay it once because once we build a vaccine well once, we don't ever have to do it again. It's a universal vaccine. Or there may even be other methods where we don't have to go with that level of GMP expense by uh, manufacturing stable pools. There's been some other companies who've made that process simpler for us. Um, or we also have contemplated going into RNA vaccines as a potential solution here. With that, I'd like to thank the Cintivax team that's made this possible. I'm also pointing out Sarah Ives, who's at CRL, was heavily involved in the development of these technologies. And uh, I'd like to thank Sinobiological. We were able to do the work that we did in those three early iterations of studies that ultimately led rise to the winning of a Gates Foundation grant for a grand challenge in the pandemic threat, be precisely because they had made available to the academic and the research community this large population of hemagglutinins. We work with them also for the RBD, the coronavirus. We work with them on HIV. Thank you, Jeff. And hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Yuning Chen from Sinobiological. And today I am going to give you a brief introduction uh, to our product portfolio for infectious disease research. Um, so first of all, Sinolo Biological is a biotech company based in Beijing, and we are a one-stop reagent and service provider. Uh, we have a, a catalog products, including genes, proteins, antibodies, and over 500 ELISA kits, and we also provide um, protein expression and the ELISA kit the antibody or ELISA kit development services. Um, so we have a rather comprehensive service portfolio that can uh, facilitate from antibody drug discovery all the way to uh, process optimizations. So in this talk, I am going to briefly uh, touch the current situation of uh, virus infectious disease, and I uh, would like to give a, a overview of the uh, the research tool sets that we have for virology research, and also summarize the talk. So, without further ado, um, let's begin. Uh, first, take a very brief look at the current situation of uh, virus infectious diseases caused by virus. So we're living in a world that is, um, you know, full of dangers and challenges, essentially. There are a lot of uh, environmental pathogens, including virus, bacteria, uh, fungus, and other type of parasites that can cause harm to the human body. And among which the viruses are, uh, are of special concern um, because of their simple life, even though they're very simple life forms, um, but they're impact on the human society can be tremendous. Uh, can be tremendous. Um, there are uh, several virus pandemics throughout the human, uh, throughout the current human history, uh, which causes um, devastation to um, devastation globally. And of course, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has um, <clears throat> caused not only the losses of life, recessions of global economy, um, but uh, a challenge to our uh, quote-unquote normal lifestyle. So the impact of viruses and the, the pandemics they cause are significant. And many of these um, virus diseases are zoonotic diseases, um, which means they can spread from uh, so they can spread from animals to humans. And with the modern industrialization and with the shrinking of the animals' habitat. Um, it is uh, believed that uh, in the future, more and more vi uh, virus diseases will impact the society again. So it is very important for us, you know, at this moment uh, to be prepared and to 
uh, to try to uh, establish uh, a tool set to um, cope with the um, with this the current uh, ongoing pandemic and also the pandemic or also other virus infectious diseases that are, are to come. So viruses are, like I said before, they're very simple life forms that contain a genome and a proteome. So for instance, the SARS-CoV-2 virus in this proteome, there are over 25 proteins. And these proteins serve at either the, at the attachment point, and for instance, the spike protein is of SARS-CoV-2, uh, and they mediate virus um, uh, internalization and hijacks the whole cell's uh, machinery to replicate and uh, assemble into new viruses. So these proteins are the um, active key in viruses, and they're also various drug targets that can be used uh, to develop antiviral um, uh, therapeutic strategies, essentially. And if you look at the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, uh, there are many linear B-cell epitopes on this protein that can also be used um, for its detection. So um, <clears throat> uh, we can uh, we say that the viral proteome or the proteins of a virus are detectable and they're druggable, but unfortunately they're also mutable, which means they change, especially the proteins in RNA viruses, uh, they change at a high frequency. So it's important, also, also important to set up uh, a platform um, that, that can produce uh, that can produce mutated virus proteins at a speed that can essentially match the, well, I wouldn't say match, but essentially catch up with the mutation rate of virus. So this is basically what we're dealing with right now. So next, I would like to give a quick review of the virology research tool sets that we have established at Sino Biological through um, years and years of hard work. Uh, so everything has been uh, as everything has has been developed has been collected into this uh, provi virus uh, research reagent bank. So in this bank, we have reagents in the form of antigen proteins, antibodies, and uh, and uh, thiolacetates and ELISA kits. So all these products um, cover uh, over fifty different type of viruses. Uh, some of them are listed here and they cover over 350 different strains. And in terms of antigen proteins, we have uh, at the, uh, the current collection, we have over 800 antigen proteins, um, among which there are uh, the proteins for SARS-CoV-2 or other coronaviruses, uh, influenza, Ebola, and other, uh, and other viruses as well. And the total number of reagents uh, come up to over, uh, over 3,000. So the core, technology that we use to generate most of these reagents are, is recombinant protein expression. And we do have a fast turnaround or fast response time in terms of their, uh, in terms of their production. Uh, so for instance, for the SARS-CoV-2, uh, it only took us uh, 12 well, business days uh, to make the protein once the, the sequence is available. And with the, <clears throat> with the quote unquote wild type sequence as a template, uh, we can generate these mutant proteins uh, in even shorter period of time. And as I mentioned before, we have a rather comprehensive uh, collection so far, and I believe uh, we might have, you know, one of the largest uh, collections for uh, virus proteins uh, in the industry. So for the uh, upper respiratory uh, virus uh, antigens, we have uh, configured them into a high throughput array that can be used to um, um, diagnostic uh, what, and to identify you know, what kind of uh, infections that is going on in a patient or in a group of patients. And we also have uh, influenza vaccine strain, um, especially we focus on the, uh, uh, fo focus on the HA protein. And uh, uh, we have, um, I, I believe over uh, 100 uh, HA in our collection. And the um, the number is increasing with uh, the update of the uh, the vaccine string every year, and of course we have a very uh, large collection of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins 
And as you can see here, we're actually trying to, uh, you know, map the SARS-CoV-2 proteum and to produce the proteins that are most relevant in terms of its uh, interaction with the host, as well as its um, uh, the enzymes that it used uh, for its replication. And for the for this for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein mutants, um, we have uh, over <clears throat> uh, 80 um, mutant proteins for the RBD um, and uh, over 10 uh, mutant proteins for the S1 region, which includes all these uh, current um, mutant strains that are prevalent, uh, you know, at this point. And uh, uh, some of the antibodies least in our um, reagent bank is uh, rather hypersensitive and they can be used in, um, <clears throat> in systems as uh, Samoa uh, HDX and uh, to reach phantom molar um, sensitivity, which means that they're very good reagents for um, diagnostic purposes. So here I would also like to give a shout out to uh, high throughput pr um, protein expression platforms and uh, that has been uh, that has been established for a little while ago uh, which was de designated for antibody production uh, but now this because of the versatility of this platform we have been using it for recombinant protein expression as well. So once we have received the sequence library of either a protein or, or an antibody, uh, we have a PCR-based method to, ca uh, to carry out a high throughput vector synthesis uh, to make the expression vectors, uh, coding these, encoding these proteins, and transfect them into a, a, a array of HEC293 cells. And the main platform that we use are actually culture flasks. In, uh, I think this is a little different from uh, maybe some of our competitors, which uh, who uses uh, maybe culture plate more. Um, but <clears throat> our take is that the exp the data generated from the culture flasks are more easily transferable to scale up, especially to the late, uh, especially uh, later if the uh, scale up protein um, or antibody production is required. Uh, in a bioreactor uh, settings. So the proteins are expressed and they can be purified through either a protein A chromatography or a uh, nickel affinity chromatography. And, and after one step, we can reach um, almost like over 90% purity of the proteins and then they can go through a high throughput validation platform that are parallel to this uh, expression platform. And the selected candidates can then um, um, we can select the candidates for uh, scale up as well. So the, st the current status of uh, this platform, uh, we have uh, 20 mil to 400 mil cultures. Um, they're carried out in flasks, as I mentioned earlier. And we can produce 100 to 200 proteins or on antibodies every week. And we have completed over 15 projects using this platform and the average success rate, at least in terms of antibody production, is over 85%, so which is decent. And we have uh, created uh, the largest library that we have created so far uh, is about contain, contained about 600 antibodies in this case. And we have used this platform to produce a lot of uh, uh, virus proteins, for instance, the HA and NA of influenza, and also the RBD mutants of SARS-CoV-2. So one of the examples is shown here. Uh, so th this is actually an uh, antibody product per production case uh, using this platform. Uh, so basically, uh, our collaborator provides us with uh, B cells uh, from the COVID-19 patients, and, and they generated the antibody library using next-gen sequencing. And then we uh, produced over 600 antibodies using this platform, uh, among which uh, 14 antibodies showed promising neutralization abilities. And uh, uh, they went through scale up to, um, we produced over 10 to, uh, we produced 10 to 300 milligrams of these proteins and they're used for animal studies and uh, structural studies as well. And the results are, are published in cell, uh, I think, in April last year. 
So with the high throughput protein expression platform, we are able to um, make actually a large collection of SARS-CoV-2 mutant proteins. And many, uh, I think most of the mutants are focused on this RBD region and especially uh, this receptor binding playing of the RBM region within the RBD, of course. So we have the UK variants, the South Africa and Brazil variants um, in, in, in the form of both uh, S1 and full length spike protein as well. And we have, a, as I mentioned earlier, we have a large collection of over 80 uh, different uh, single amino acid mutations or a combination of amino acid mutations um, you know, within the RBD. So uh, based on the structure of the, of the RBD, I think we're gradually start to map um, the RBM with the mutants. And I think we're, co uh, we're covering uh, a large area of the RBM uh, at, at this point based on our high throughput uh, protein expression platform. And the proteins, uh, the RBDs uh, produced in these uh, with in this platform showed very good uh, activity in terms of uh, its binding to uh, ACE2, ACE, yeah, uh, assayed by either ELISA or more sensitive uh, binding analysis such as uh, octad. And of course, with various virus proteins, we, um, which allows us to develop virus-specific antibodies. Uh, so we ha we also have a rather comprehensive um, antibody discovery tools, including hybridoma, phage display, B cell sortings, and also polyclonal antibody generations. So the antibodies generated using these plat uh, <clears throat> these techniques are actually um, uh, are excellent quality. Um, we we have generated um, SARS-CoV-2 spike neutralizing antibodies, which is specific to SARS-CoV-2. And for also uh, for the nucleocapsid protein, because it is um, uh, widely recognized as a good candidate for, uh, for immunological uh, detections. So um, we generated or uh, we, we generated or screened like or identified antibodies that has spe high specificity and also high sensitivity against this nucleocapsid. Uh, nucleocapsid protein and formulated these antibody pairs into ELISA kits as well. These ELISA kits actually showed very good signals against uh, mu mutants of the nucleocapsid proteins, which means um, they're not compromised by the uh, you know selected mut mutants of the nucleocapsid uh, to date, at least. So with that, I would like to summarize, uh, summarize the talk. So virus infectious diseases are imminent threat and we do need uh, tools to help us prepare for such challenges in, you know, in the near future. And we have established this proviral uh, pro antigen bank and it's continuously expanding. And we do hope that uh, <clears throat> with, with the help uh, with our technology and uh, um, with our effort to create um, these virus, either re uh, e either antigens or uh, antibodies and ELISA, uh, ELISA kits or other related products, uh, we would contribute to the, you know, to the battle against these invisible enemies, invisible enemies in the future. So with that, uh, I would also like to thank Jim for this, uh, uh, for this opportunity to showcase our uh, our product portfolio, and thank you for uh, thank you for your attention, and thank you for listening. Jake, you need wonderful presentations. Really appreciate that. I'm sure the audience is uh, pretty excited about what you guys have presented. So let's jump right into the Q&A session and get to as many of their questions as possible. Bear with us for just a moment as we transfer into the Q&A. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us for the Q&A session. We have our two presenters here and let's get to it. Uh, Jake, the first question is gonna be for you. Uh, one of our audience members would like to know, uh, when will this broad spectrum influenza vaccine reach the market? Sure, so right now the vaccine 
uh, as I'd mentioned, is being tested in ferrets. That's the, the species you need to test in before going into human trials, according to the FDA. We're also testing with pigs, and that's directly for the veterinary market for pigs. Uh, with the completion of those studies, which are contemplated to finish by the end of this year in 2021, we would enter into manufacturing. So manufacturing is the single slowest part of this whole process. Uh, that could be uh, in the 12 to 18 month window. And given the complexity of this vaccine, we're anticipating closer towards the 18 month window. Uh, at that point, we would be entering phase studies. So we currently have phase studies contemplated in 2023, 2024, and then 2025 would be the period where we would be seeking approval. All right, great. Thanks for that. Um, Yuning, we have a question for you. Uh, an audience member would like to know, how is Sinobiological involved in the field of COVID-19 vaccine development? Okay, so um, we have, actually, we have not directly developed the vaccine ourselves, uh, as most of uh, you know, other uh, big manufacturers in China. Uh, but we do supply, like I mentioned in the, in the talk earlier, uh, some critical uh, great ingredient essentially uh, to facilitate this uh, vaccine development process. All right, thank you. Uh, Jake, question for you. Um, what made you choose to work with Sino for your HA, NA, and HIV proteins rather than produce them in-house? Sure, so this was part of a uh, you know, discussion that's happened over years on uh, as a unique consideration of the vaccine technology that we uh, use at Cinevax, uh, we have to develop many different proteins from lots of different strain variants. And that's, that's, that's how the technology works. We mix together lots of strain variants from H HIV or separately lots of strain variants from influenza, the HA or the NA proteins. And because we had to produce so many strains, we were considering going and developing those in-house. Uh, the problem with this is that these viral coproteins are tricky and it involves a certain amount of expertise to be able to produce them. And it's time consuming, the purification. You know, these, there, there's tests and, and expertise that would make them easier to be able to process these things. So uh, going back to 2017, when we started working on these programs, we discovered much to our delight as we were <laughs> planning to go do all this in-house, that Sinobiological already had an inventory for a number of the proteins we wanted to work with. So we were able to rapidly iterate based on their growing inventory of these proteins that we were interested in, both for screening, but also as, as the, uh, the agents for our, re our research and development work for the immunizations. Um, that enabled us to move pretty quickly for the first couple of years. And then after being awarded the Gates Foundation in the Pandemic Threat Award, uh, we had a, a larger set of resources and that was again, preparing material that would ultimately become our final drug substance. And, and because they were already experts at working with these proteins, we thought it made more sense to engage them on a larger partnership and they developed a large number of these additional proteins for us and that avoided us having to go develop the internal expertise they have the cell lines and they're they're in-house experts already so they've been a great partner with us to be able to tell us look of the ones we've worked with we can tell you there's certain types of engineering considerations that may want to apply and they have a couple different expression systems they know how to purify these these are tricky proteins some of them are ph sensitive uh and so having people that actually know how to produce them is just it just turned out to be a radically better idea than us trying to produce them in-house. And that same strategy is being applied as we move into HIV and to some other proteins where they have the built-in expertise. And so we can do the thing that we do best, which is the computation and then the in vivo studies. And then we work in partnership with uh, Sinobiological for the ability to go source the proteins. That's also true in our coronavirus research where they have a large compendium of the, the mutants. So rather than us having to go produce these mutants, we can work with them to in-house them. And as a general principle, my strategy as a business is I ask myself, what is it that I am uniquely good at and no one else can do? And I do that thing. If there's other things that I could do or I could spend time and eventually be good at, I ask myself, does somebody else already really good at this? And I'd rather work with them rather than having to try to build it up myself because otherwise I'm playing catch up. Somebody's already ahead of me. Why not just create a partnership? And that, that creates a more successful uh, business strategy and it allows me to do what I'm really good at and have a set of partnerships around us, like with Sinobiological that are good at what they do. And so I can, we can all move together faster to the future. Yeah, I mean, that makes perfect sense. So thanks for that. I appreciate that. Um, Yuning, uh, question for you. This one's a good question. I think a lot of the people in the general audience would want to know this. How do you go about choosing the most suitable system for virus protein expression? Okay, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's indeed a very, uh, I think it's very generalized question in, in terms of, uh, you know, suitable system selections. 
because um, for uh, recombinant protein expression, there is, uh, you know, unfortunately at this time, still a, a no a one system fit all approach that we can use. So I think it depending on uh, the characteristics of different virus proteins, uh, the, uh, the extent of uh, post-translational modifications they would require, and also basically what, what's going to be the downstream processes. Um, <clears throat> so we basically choose uh, expression systems um, with you know, those factors in consideration. So for instance, uh, the, uh, we have produced a bunch of uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins. And since these are very complicated glycoproteins, and uh, apparently glycosylation plays a very important role in terms of its function and it's uh, um, and also somehow mediates the host uh, virus interactions. So <clears throat> glycosylation is required. Uh, so that's uh, <clears throat> so we would choose a host that would um, um, that would be um, that would successfully add glycosylations to the virus proteins. So um, either a mammalian cell system or an insect system might be a good choices. Uh, but you know, for virus, if for some enzymes of viruses, uh, <clears throat> sometimes the E. coli system should be sufficient uh, in terms of their expressions uh, for uh, for purposes uh, uh, like uh, you know small molecule binder screenings or maybe other related drug discovery efforts. Uh, but sometimes we do observe some you know function discrepancies uh, with proteins expressed. Um, by E. coli, so if the protein does not uh, meet, let's say, function requirements, then we switch to another system. So we had a, a good experience uh, when expressing the, the RNA-dependent RNA uh, polymerase from SARS-CoV-2. Uh, either the uh, expression in the E. coli system is not successful, or you know the protein produced is somehow um, ha has some quality issues in terms of its you know structure integrity and function, and then we uh, switch to a more you know quote unquote advanced um, uh, expression host cell uh, in this case the insect cell which produce a very stable protein that is uh, <clears throat> uh, meets our you know qualification uh, qualification satisfactories. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, you know pieces involved and in it's uh, basically a trial and error uh, process. But uh, I think like Jacob said, we have, we did have um, uh, during this process of a decade, uh, we did have uh, gathered some experience in terms of, you know, uh, how to, uh, how to deal with, you know, different proteins from different strains, of, uh, either from a different strain of the same virus or from, you know, different virus strains. So, um, yeah, I think uh, we would also be very much like to share our, uh, I wouldn't say expertise, but share our experience with the you know scientific or industry community, um, and forge you know partnerships and to see how we can move forward with um, uh, you know such as uh, yes you know such projects. All right, great, thanks, um, Jacob. You mentioned uh, before uh, something about ferrets, and we have a question here from one of our audience members who, who asked, "Why are you using ferrets as your in vivo model for the broad spectrum coronavirus vaccine efforts?" Sure. So <clears throat> there's two reasons behind that. Um, the first is historical. Um, our broad spectrum vaccine technology we first played out in, in against influenza and. And for influenza, you need to go through ferrets to uh, go to humans next. You actually do not need to go to non-human primates, but the ferret for historical reasons, and arguably because the lung tissue of ferrets is very similar to humans, that's, that's the species you test in. Um, that's helpful to us because we've sent our, our vaccine, we send it through pigs and then also through ferrets. And in the process, we've tested a large panel of possible adjuvants and depot delivery agents that slowly release the vaccine. The purpose here was to try to figure out what's the least number of shots that gives the highest titer result. And, and those results are a little bit different from organism to organism. So what's true in a pig and a mouse might be different than a mouse, might be different than a ferret, might be different from, from a human. And so when possible, we like to return to the same model organism um, because we can leverage some of that, that information. And again, that is an appropriate model organism as we go towards humans. Uh, again, the, the, there's a second reason here, and that is that the, the ferrets are very susceptible to the coronavirus. So it enables you to have a good model organism that you could do a live challenge study with. Um, particularly, they have some pretty attractive properties around 
um, aging, aging ferrets and, and susceptibility of, of lung tissue damage, which is attractive. There's a third reason. And that is the same reason that in our influenza vaccine program, we went through pigs. Uh, and the reason we did that was that the pig actually gets the same kinds of flus that humans get. So it's a good model of the disease, better than a mouse. But also there's $175 million per year market for flu vaccines for pigs. And so in the process of using that model, I have a veterinary product prior to going towards human. That's uh, money coming back faster. And it forces us as scientists to do the right, solve the actual problem in front of us. If you're trying to treat a mouse for flu, it doesn't really get flu normally. You're kind of treating a different type of disease where you're actually solving the exact problem in the pig. It's a good representative model of the underlying disease process. And you get money faster. It shortens the long track of red from having to go through clinical trials from an idea to profitability. The, the final advantage there is that pigs are a reservoir species for influenzas and they're the basis of recombination. The pandemics, the five that we've had in the last century of influenza, uh, in almost all cases, there's clear evidence that recombination took place in a pig. And so if you can create a broad spectrum vaccine and you can issue it to the pig populations as well as the human populations, you can begin to contemplate pushing influenza outside of the human experience back to the birds where it belongs. Now, let's go back to coronavirus. The reason we're going into ferrets for those reasons I mentioned, in addition to this last reason, is that mink like, are very similar to ferrets and they're hugely susceptible to the coronavirus. Denmark was about to kill 17 million mink. They had started that process of killing all the mink because they were getting very worried that there was high transmission of a new mutant strain of uh, the coronavirus in the mink and it was populated going back and forth between the mink and humans. So an easy zoonotic transfer. Uh, that told me right away that there's a veterinary market in coronavirus research. That veterinary market, like by the way, has likely grown with the advent of the B1351. That's the South African strain, similar strain that we see in Brazil and in Japan. Um, that strain has increased its infectivity in, in humans by 40 to 80%, depending on which study you read, but it's also increased its infectivity in mice and cats and dogs, potentially bovines. And so there's a potentially large emerging veterinary market where it would be of great interest to go give your, your mink or maybe your cat and your dog, maybe your, your cow, a coronavirus shot rather than it being a liability to the other herd animals and to you, the humans. Um, and so that's the objective. And that's actually what we're doing with this is we're pushing it as a veterinary first product. And then I hope the day never comes, but in the event that we have a broad spectrum coronavirus vaccine that works great in the mink market and these other veterinary markets, uh, and, and that we have not yet established good uh, endemic uh, suppression of this virus globally, which is starting to look like maybe we won't, then we would be able to escalate that program up into humans next. But in the meantime, I can fly it over under the radar and get into a veterinary market uh, using the right kinds of animal models to treat the right kind of disease to make money early, but ultimately to escalate to humans. So that's the full strategy that we're applying. I mean, that's a um, makes perfect sense. A very logical strategy and, and money coming in is never a bad thing either. So uh, thanks for that. Appreciate that. Um, you need a question for you. Um, can you elaborate on what strategies you use to achieve the trimeric format of certain uh, virus proteins by recombinant protein expression? Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think there, um, that depends on, uh, well, uh, there are many ways for um, this kind of a, a, a structure configuration to happen. So some virus proteins, for instance, the uh, HA protein or the spike protein of coronavirus, HA protein of influenza, they already have uh, this sort of uh, like sort of trimeric modules built in within these proteins. Um, but the, but the un unfortunately, um, when they're produced in a high yield format via recombinant expression, uh, you know, sometimes the, the proteins will have a, a correct configuration so that when they're produced, they can form, uh, they can formulate this uh, trimeric format. And um, however, because it's, a, you know, essentially a massive reproduction uh, production uh, kind of a situation. So some of the proteins will unfortunately come out as um, <clears throat> uh, uncorrectly folded. Uh, some of that will aggregate and be removed dur during the uh, purification process. Uh, but some will still remain in the, uh, you, you know, in, in the mixture, essentially. So um, I think the simplest approach, I wouldn't call it simplest, but uh, uh, a one viable approach is to add a, you know, trimeric uh, domain at the end of the protein. Um, for instance, uh, I think a photon 
uh, uh, derived from, I think, a uh, lambda phage is a very uh, effective uh, trimeric domain that can be used uh, to add to essentially many uh, different proteins. We have used it uh, on uh, uh, the uh, HA protein and the spike proteins, uh, uh, many different types of coronaviruses uh, to achieve this uh, trimeric format. Uh, but also uh, some, uh, <clears throat> I think there are published record indicating uh, we can tweak uh, some residues in the, the trimeric, uh, in the endogenous trimeric domain of the proteins, uh, of the virus proteins to make these trimers more stable. And, th and this is also something um, that we can do or something we can help uh, clients with. Uh, but it would require some, <clears throat> but it would require some uh, 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 deep understanding of the stru structure of the protein to begin with. But then we can uh, start to modeling and uh, through modeling and also maybe make some uh, small amounts or <clears throat> small amounts of proteins to screen for the for the uh, like the most stable trimeric format uh, of the protein via some you know uh, simple site directed mutagenesis onto the, uh, the endogenous trimeric portion of the proteins. So basically either you can add something extra or, you know, uh, or to do something to the backbone of the protein. All right, thank you, Yuning. Um, Jake, this next question you may have answered most of it in your last question, but I'll ask anyway in case there's some extra points you want to put in. An audience member asked again, I think it's a pretty important thing. You mentioned about the in vivo studies in ferrets and pigs. Um, why choose these animal models rather than non-human primates? Is there anything else you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I think the, <clears throat> I get asked that question relatively frequently and the, and the main reason is you don't have to. So uh, in the case of influenza, for historical reasons, ferret, ferret is the model. And so you go through ferrets, they're a little bit less expensive to work with, and you have more comparison of your data to the many other groups that have developed uh, vaccines for influenza against that model. So there's a, you know, a better comparator and, and you know, these models aren't a perfect predictor of success, but you can at least compare how you're performing, can benchmark yourself against the community. Whereas if you go off and use a different model, you're less able to do that. Uh, there, there's obviously the cost advantage, the primates are, uh, a little more precious. And so working with them can be more challenging um, from that perspective. Um, with the coronavirus, you have the advantage again that you um, have the susceptible animal models. So for, they're appropriate for a live challenge. And I think if, you, if you're gonna do live challenge, if you, can, if you can spare a primate, you should do that. So there's also some ethical considerations. I think it's a suitable alternative model like the Syrian hamsters and then the, the ferret. So those things all make sense. Now, certainly there are certain applications where we do research where we think I actually feel the opposite. I feel like uh, I wish we could go into primates right away. Um, some aspects where the, the immune system is just fundamentally different in primates than it is in, in mice or even, even a, a hamster or a ferret. I'm always concerned that what we're observing about tolerated toxicity or some other property might surprise us until we go to a primate. So I, I really do wish I could actually have the appropriate war chest to go drive things into to small primates early on for certain types of research. But, but ultimately, it, it depends. And also whether there's a market. There isn't really a medicine market for primates, whereas there are for a series of these other, um, these other veterinary or, or herd animal uh, indications. All right. Um, Yuning, a uh, question for you. One audience member asks, what is the intended use of the RBD mutants and in what form are they supplied? Okay, thanks. Yeah, we do have a lot of that. <clears throat> Uh, that's kind of like unfortunate event because you know the virus is mutating so fast you know, and constantly. So we have to um, you know somehow keep up with you know somehow keep up with this pace. And because the mutants are you know popping out and now and then uh, all over the world. So <clears throat> I think fortunately we have this uh, uh, high throughput system so that we can make these uh, mutations rather quickly. Uh, so I think I would uh, I'd like to answer the second part uh, first, uh, which is the format that they're supplied. Um, <clears throat> so in China, uh, we can supply these uh, mutants in the format of you know individual vials or either on either mount them on ELISA plates for 
you know, quick screening purposes. But uh, uh, I think it, uh, to ship, I think there are some logistic issues <clears throat> related uh, about the ELISA, <clears throat> excuse me, about the ELISA type of format. Um, <clears throat> so uh, maybe some issues involved to ship those into the, into the United States. So I think for uh, most of our Western, uh, the customers from the you know, Western side of the hemisphere, uh, the format are now uh, rather limited to uh, uh, you know, individual vials. Uh, but we are <clears throat> also working with some collaborators to make these, you know, RBD uh, mutants into a chip format, so so that it, it will facilitate essentially the uh, high throughput screening of uh, <clears throat> uh, of ant antibodies, or um, just to check if an antibody, uh, uh, if there's any, uh, you know, sort of uh, you know escape events that is happening. Uh, so I think that also kind of answers the uh, the first part of the question, which is what the RBD mutants are intended to do. Because um, <clears throat> uh, I think that there are some you know some antibody evading events happening with certain mutants. Uh, for instance, the the mutant variants derived I think from uh, South Africa uh, showed uh, some extent of uh, you know antibody uh, escape from these. Uh, from the therapeutic antibodies, I, uh, uh, maybe from uh, either Regeneron or um, uh, some some other companies. So, uh, in order to you know, in order to have to verify that an, an antibody, a therapeutic antibody, quote unquote, is um, relatively broad to the spectrum, so we would require this sort of uh, you know uh, RBD mutant library, so we can screen those antibodies uh, against this library to see you know. What kind of mutants would um, essentially compromise activity um, activity of the antibody? So, <clears throat> I think that's one of the primary uh, applications for these uh, RBD mutants. And also, we're not only like making RBD mutants, but we're expanding this uh, kind of spectrum uh, to make mute, uh, to make mutants um, extended from the RBD to the whole S1 domain of the SARS uh, SARS CoV2 spike protein. Uh, so, um, which, <clears throat> you know, this S1 domain contains more, essentially more uh, therapeutic and neutralizing antibody epitopes, so that we would like to, you know, uh, uh, to cover more ground, essentially, uh, and uh, <clears throat> to help um, do, a, you know, help, especially at the early stage, to a very quick, uh, to get some very quick data in, in terms of uh, if the, the binding affinity uh, of the therapeutic antibody against, uh, you know, some of these mutants to, to investigate if the mutation will cause some, you know, compromise in the in their binding affinities. And I'll, I'll add to that that um, Sinovax uses the Sinobiological RBD panel for our <laughs> CTP9 antibody therapeutic program. We got their whole panel in. I feel like we have over 20 variants, and so that's a really powerful way for us to test. And it, it tells us two things right away. First, it tells us is our antibody vulnerable? We engineered it to be a broadly neutralizing antibody. So now we test it and go, how, how much is it able to hit all these new emerging variants? And second, because they're placed all over the RBD, it gives us immediately some epitope information on where the, if you, if you for any given antibody, you'll find a, a couple of mutants that might be affected on some site. It tells you where your antibody binds. So it's, it's a powerful tool. And it was great to be able to just get those proteins right away and be able to work with them. Yeah, I think now we have maybe like more than 80 in our inventory. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hopefully it's not going to add too much, you know, work to your... Expect situation. another order from us because, uh, yeah, <laughs> so we keep track of all the new mutant frequencies coming up out of GISAID. So we have some that we, we don't have yet. So we'll expect an order from us. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, we're solving the problems right on this uh, webinar. Good job, guys. All right, uh, Jake, we have a question for you. Um, pretty thought-provoking one, actually. Um, do you think you can really eradicate influenza even with a broad-spectrum vaccine? Yeah, it's a uh, that's a million-dollar question, isn't it? Um, so I think the answer is yes, but there are challenges. So influenza uh, mutates every year. And really, there are some nice studies around the uh, swine flu pandemic that were performed in Japan and some other sites where you could see really how quickly the virus mutates even within a single season. You can see this tree of variation emerging, much less like what we're experiencing with the coronavirus. Um, and so because it changes every year, the vaccines become obsolete and we need to make new ones. 
So what happens in a you know perfect world if we have a broad spectrum vaccine, like our vaccine comes out and now, now you have a shot that actually protects their, against the new versions of influenza. Is that gonna be enough to actually eradicate the pathogen? So there's a couple challenges here. One is that influenza doesn't just infect humans. As I mentioned, it also infects pigs and it also infects birds. There, there are other species that are infected with kind of specialized strains. There's a little bit of infection going into cats and dogs and camels and so forth, but your, your major populations of influenzas that get into people are going through pigs. Um, so that means that it's not enough to just va vaccinate the human population. You'd have to vaccinate enough of us. That's the same problem we're running into right now with the coronavirus. So a large proportion of the population would need to be vaccinated uh, and, and second, and that's the other reason I'm creating a veterinary product is that you'd want to vaccinate those pigs as well, particularly large farms of lots of pigs, so 10,000 pigs that are near each other. And if influenza that gets in there could spread like wildfire, it could mutate as it goes. And if those pigs are near birds, then there can be recombination because the RNA from influenza, the, the different bits can shuffle up um, when, if, if an animal is co-infected with multiple viruses. That's, how, that's one of the ways we get pandemics. So that through those methods, in theory, you could push influenza. You're not going to get influenza out of the birds. So birds fly around the world. They spread influenzas. But the bird influenzas are quite different than the ones that get into humans. The avian influenzas typically don't propagate very well at all in humans. And they're a pretty rare phenomenon. And without the, the danger that they could shuffle up with uh, human or pig-adapted influenzas, the risk goes way down. So I think it is possible uh, that you could uh, large-scale vaccinate pig populations and human populations and make uh, drive down the frequency of influenza such that it just is sort of sputtering out and unable to propagate. But in order to do that, enough people would have to be vaccinated, which means you'd have to make enough of it. Enough people would have to be willing to take the vaccine. Um, and, and I think, honestly, that's more challenging than the pig market. The pig market, all you need to do is convince people they're going to lose less pig meat because all their pigs aren't going to get sick. The farmers will do it. I think you can get governments to tell, far, tell pigs to do it. It's harder to get the government to tell people to do it. And so I think that, that's an open question, frankly, with influenza as it is with the coronavirus. Yeah, that's a good point for sure. Um, Yuning, uh, we have another question for you. Uh, does Sinobiological develop therapeutic antibodies for infectious diseases? Um, well, the short answer is no, because um, we're <clears throat> we're basically a reagent supplier. So we, even though we do have the capacity, or uh, I do have, I think we do have the technical capability of developing those uh, therapeutic antibodies. But you know, these um, kind of projects usually take extremely long, uh, long time to to complete. And uh, I think it's not our current focus at this point. Uh, but we do have we do help uh, you know clients uh, to to uh, carry out projects like this. Uh, so uh, I think in um, one of my slides, uh, there, was a, um, there was a reference uh, published in Cell. So that's the, uh, this is a project we collaborated with the uh, local institute here in Beijing. So they, they actually have, uh, you know, the an antibodies sequenced from, you know, essentially convalescent, convalescent plasma. And we, we, massively produce, you know, hundreds of antibodies, you know, using our platform so they can go back and, 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 then, uh, and I think identify a uh, suitable neutralizing antibodies. I think they have found a bunch and uh, because, you know, these are human antibodies to begin with. So uh, I think they can move along rather quickly um, during this therapeutic antibody development pipeline. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, we do participate in uh, some of, uh, in these uh, projects, but, but uh, uh, the short answer is uh, we ourselves do not uh, have the intention, at least for this time being, to you know develop uh, such antibodies, therapeutic antibodies ourselves. May I ask a slightly related question to Sino? So yeah. we're really happy working with you guys. So you produce great protein, and it's been help. We actually work with you for producing our any a bunch of our antibodies. We put in, I think, our fourth order recently. Uh, we work with you for the the viral proteins. Um, it's been, it's been a great working relationship. I've just been really consistently impressed by the quality of the scientists and the, the folks that work on, uh, with us, um, Kong Thanks. in particular, I want to give a shout out to, um, <laughs> so I guess my question is, you know, I, I have to ask as we move forward from research into, uh, discovery, uh, have you given any consideration to the potential of expanding your footprint into manufacturing? So for instance, you have this backhoe virus system. Of course, I want to ask, oh, since you know how to produce all of these things, is that something in the future you might consider becoming like a, going into GMP or producing the cell lines that could be suitable for long-term manufacture? That, that, if, if you had 
we're planning to produce that capability, I'd like to talk to you about it because uh, you know, you've been a good partner and I'd like to find future yeah. ways that we can continue to work together. Yeah, I think the <clears throat> I think the short answer is yes. So we're expo <clears throat> uh, we're exploring you know other possibilities to you know we're trying to expand our business either uh, as a supplier of reagents or you know CRO services, um, but also I think eventually we will um, uh, we will try to um, expand to the to the realm of uh, either a, a CDMO or you know other contracted manufacturers at a larger scale. Uh, but I, I think currently uh, there are just some, um, I think, patent issues or that we need to entangle because uh, <clears throat> if we would like to produce, especially uh, therapeutic antibodies uh, using uh, CHO cell lines, there are uh, some heavy pat patents related, uh, heavy patent issues that need to be circumvented. You know, some licenses have, that has to be required. And also we're trying to <clears throat> develop uh, an in-house. Uh, so we have already have our, uh, in-house uh, developed create, um, culture media transfection agents and also you know the the plasmid that goes you know with um, <clears throat> these reagents that can actually perform quite well uh, under this you know transient expression uh, 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 process which I think we've been working with each other uh, for a long time uh, using such approach uh, but yeah, if it's we're trying to move the uh, expression from a transient to a cell line or, uh, or on a you know stable cell line based <clears throat> uh, based work platform, uh, there's some still some you know tweaking that needs to be done in order to you know move uh, that move to that stage. But you know this is something that we are actively uh, pursuing. So maybe uh, uh, I think in the maybe in the short uh, in the near future we can have like this conversation again, and maybe we'll be. Uh, much more better equipped uh, for, for such tasks. That sounds great. All right. Uh, Jake, we have, uh, looks like we have two more questions for you. Uh, first one, an audience member would like to know, what are some of the challenges of producing some of the proteins that you were discussing? Yeah, they're a mess. That's why that's why we want Sino to do it for us. Um, so, so the you know we work you know we we do in house transient transfection. We mostly work with HEC two nine three cells um, in my laboratory compared to Cho, just because for for what I do, I often want the faster turnaround time, and I just need to produce a little bit to test something. Um, and and some proteins work great; they're simple and easy to work with. And some some require some 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 love. You know, you need to I kind of understand the biology and make some appropriate adaptations. And and. And generally, each protein family tells its own story. Uh, that's particularly true with these viral coat proteins. So they tend to be trimeric or have multimer multimeric forms, like NA. Um, and they may have sensitivity to cleavage um, to be able to mature them or be pretty mature. They may have mutations that people have discovered in the literature that someone who's an expert knows about, but I wouldn't necessarily, of like a placing a proline or modifying a site. Um, and, and, and they, they may have special considerations around purification. So some of these proteins like HA is sensitive to pH changes. That's actually how it exploits the endosome. And so if you're not careful on your purification routine, you could accidentally unfold or change the structure of a whole bunch of your proteins. So those are the, the kinds of considerations. You know, there's, you, you can go in and solve this or you could start doing it from scratch where I'd go take control antibodies and I'd take a vector and start fiddling around and trying to look for control binding sites. And like, you know, we do some of that, but uh, in general, if we want to produce these things, particularly as we're moving um, towards lots of variants, uh, and rather than starting from scratch, I think I'm always concerned about what I don't know, and because then I don't know even to ask the question about it. And for that reason, I'd rather work with people who already have a bunch of experience, and uh, you know that's that's been really valuable, especially these complicated HIV proteins and the the HAs and the NAs. We got a lot of guidance from Sino where we sat down and we're like, okay, here's what you're going to try to do. So. Here's how we're going to do it. We just have these experiences that these these subtypes tend to work better in this one cell line than this other. Here's some techniques we can apply and we can switch over. There's a bunch of stuff I wouldn't know to think about. And I, anyway, I don't have all these cell lines active at, uh, at my fingertips, and, and they do, which is um, which is very helpful. All right, great. And it looks like we have time for one last question for you, Jake. Um, one audience member would like to know if you think you're going to face manufacturing challenges in producing the C3 broad spectrum vaccine. Yeah, so there, there is. And um, so the way that the vaccine works, right, is that we, we get around the problem that most of your B cells aren't responding to conserved sites. This is the fundamental reason why. Why do these conserved sites exist, but your immune system messes the most of the time? And we address that 
by creating a mixture of multiple different hemagglutinins or multiple GP140s. And we put each one at a very low concentration so that by itself, if we just put in that amount into an animal, it wouldn't respond. But because we put in 30 all at the same time and they all have that low concentration, then B cells that recognize something shared across 10 or 20 or 30 of those, those ones get enough dose to activate. So we're, we're dosing the B cells proportional to the breadth of the epitope they recognize. We're linking concentration and conservation. Uh, that approach requires multiple components. We have to go suddenly produce. We can't produce one recombinant HA. We need to produce 30, right? And so that was, I would say, the major pushback that we always got from initial talking with BARDA or talking with the Gates Foundation or really anyone was like, it's going to be such a mess to GMP. And, and partially that's true, but I, I have an easy, strong answer here. So first off, you know, if this is creating the universal vaccine, then who cares? You saw that's, that's an engineering problem. The first one's an existential problem. So if we can solve that, and by the way, we're testing our technology, like I said, also on the coronavirus and also on HIV. If we have breakthrough broad spectrum vaccines in these areas, then whatever that engineering problem is, you're gonna solve it to create the breakthrough of, of medicine. Um, with respect to that breakthrough, there's a couple approaches. One is just the brute force approach. We're just gonna go ahead and GMP all the pieces and suffer. Um, I mean, that sounds awful and it's, that's expensive. Uh, but it's not unprecedented. We already have 23 valent vaccines. So this is just a shift by degree up to 30 from 23. There's been many different valencies of increasingly complex vaccines where the individual components are GMP'd and then they're mixed afterwards. It's a big cost, but you only pay it once and you pay it up front. Uh, after that, you don't have to change the vaccine every year. So then you get around the problem. Right, right now, it is certainly insanely expensive because we have to go restart this process every single year to make a new flu shot. And so this would be a big cost once and it would flatline afterwards. And that's where governments come in. They can help cover that cost. And that cost is still, it may, sounds much worse, but it's still going to be way cheaper than the, the clinical studies are still more expensive. Um, that, and then the next step strategy are that there are these breakthroughs in FDA acceptance or partial acceptance in an approach of a cocktail, of a a stable pool line of multiple cell lines. Each one produces a different component of related of the of uh, the protein, and you mix them all together and you GMP that batch. Uh, what you have to prove is that that batch produces a consistent ratio of the proteins in those. So, a simple example would be two cells. Each cell produces like a different protein. A more complicated case would be like thirty things. Uh, that has complexity. I tell you, the, the manufacturers hate this concept and they've been resistant to it for 15 years, but I'll also tell you the world has changed and it's increasingly accepting of cocktails. And so as we have more cocktail drugs, I'll tell you five years ago, you could, nobody like the FDA would not like basically always ask you, why do you need a cocktail? And people would engineer by specifics just to get around having to make a cocktail to antibodies. So they're fiddling with their drug to avoid <laughs> manufacturing two cell lines. Whereas recently in the coronavirus, that's the opposite. The FDA asks you, haven't you considered a cocktail for this? Why aren't you producing more antibodies? And so that's created a, an opening of the space into, there are companies like Symphogen and Maris that came up with the idea of stable pools of multiple cell lines that you mix together to create a stable output and you just GMP that stable pool. Uh, the more extreme example would be Gigagen recently created something called Giga 2050 which is this, it's the ultimate slippery slope extreme where they have thousands of different cells that are basically the ultimate stable pool, which is just releasing essentially like IVIG. It's like thousands of different antibodies against a target. You're kind of making almost like a, you know, polyclonal um, sera from subjects and you're just distilling it down to a standardized process. And so the argument is, well, if you've accepted that, then surely you should accept 30 things. And so that's a second strategy. And the third strategy is to adopt the RNA uh, immunization technologies. So there you're not trying to produce all the proteins, you just produce 30 different types of RNA and you mix them together and then that, that becomes the agent which is delivered. You've outsourced the responsibility of expression to the body of the host. Um, that's potentially attractive. These vaccines certainly have worked quite potently, um, but there are some unique considerations about what happens if a cell gets co-transfected with multiple RNAs from different hemagglutinins at the same time, is that going to create a dominant negative effect on trying to create trimers that are, that are heterologous? And, and maybe that will actually corrupt your expression profile and so forth. Though, though I don't have the answer to that. That involves experimentation. So those are the three trajectories. There are, there are uh, you know, there are challenges. This is not the easiest path, but we've tried the easiest path. We've thrown the easiest stone for 30 years at this problem and it hasn't solved the problem. So it's time to go push a little harder and ask ourselves, okay, yeah, maybe it's inconvenient, but if there's eternal health on the other side of it, that's a worth a little bit of a walk to get there. And that, that's what we're intending to do. Couldn't agree more. I like it. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for this discussion. This is really, really great. Appreciate it.
but all good things must come to an end and we are at the end of our webinar. So I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived on the GEN website at genengineers.com for up to a year. So if you missed any parts of it, you can watch it again or feel free to forward the link to any of your friends and colleagues, which we always recommend. I'd like to thank Jake and Yuning for their very informative presentations. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attention and very thoughtful questions. And a very special thanks to Cinebiological for sponsoring this webinar. Hopefully we'll see you again at another gym webinar in the near future. Goodbye for now. Everyone stay safe and healthy and get your vaccines. Thank you. Hey, take care.